Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, how multiplexed imaging reveals key insights into the tumor microenvironment to inform treatment and improve outcomes. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing science collaboration and learning. It is brought to you by Sativa. Sativa is a global provider of technologies and services that advance and accelerate the development and manufacture of therapeutics. Formerly part of GE Healthcare Life Sciences, they have a rich heritage tracing back hundreds of years and a fresh beginning since 2020. For more information on our sponsor, you can click on the sponsor logo on the left side of your screen or visit sativalifesciences.com. Now let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I'd like to now introduce our host of today's webinar, Paul Goodwin, President of the Histochemical Society and Science Director of Sativa. For complete biographies on all our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Paul. The floor is yours. Christy, thank you very much for your introduction. I'm uh, looking forward to telling you about our multiplex imaging and, and the role in understanding the tissue microenvironment. Uh, I'm Paul Goodwin, as Christy introduced. Um, I'll be talking about the resurgence of multiplex immunohistochemistry and a bit of the history of the field. I'll be followed by Dr. Fiona Genti, who will be talk, who is a researcher and technical manager uh, in, in biosciences at the GE Research Center. She'll be telling us about cell dive imaging, a decade of research validation and translation. And then we'll be followed by Prachi Baghetto. Uh, Prachi is a, the diagnostic segment leader and marketing leader for cell analysis within Celtiva. And she'll be talking to us about the cell dive imaging, advancing cancer research and care. I'd like to start us off by uh, looking at the, the history and, and resurgence of multiplex immunohistochemistry. And to me, the story starts with cancer. If you think of cancer, uh, and I know for a long time I was locked in my career thinking of cancer as a disease of genetics and the cell cycle, um, but that's part of the story. So as cells um, are exposed to the environment, uh, they have a genetic history and the age of the uh, individual, uh, you accumulate a series of mitotic, um, uh, sorry, a series of genetic um, defects in the cells. This leads to loss of control of mitosis, which then uh, means that checkpoints, the proofreading of the genome gets skipped, which leads to more genetic instability, which leads to more mutations, which leads to, to more skipping, et cetera. But that's only part of the story. Uh, that leads to unche unchecked cell growth. The other part of cancer is a loss of identity. So cells live within an environment um, and they understand who they are, what they are, what they're supposed to be doing because of the environment around them. If they lose their ability to sense that environment and interact with, that, with other cells in that environment, again, because of the cells themselves, their environment or the age, they then lose their identity and they don't think they no longer belong where they are. And so they'll go walk about. The, we call that meta, um, metastasis. And those cells will go and try to find a new environment where they feel more at home which can lead to more disruption of their sensing of the environment, which leads to more um, metastasis, et cetera. So if we want to understand um, immuno-oncology or the interaction of the immune system uh, and cancer, we have to realize that cancer is not just a genetic disease. Um, there also is a wide and meaningful dynamic range for many structures and objects 
um, that are, are important for understanding the interaction of not only the, the genetic defects within the cells, but also their inter interaction with the environment. So it's not enough to know that how many cells I have per area. I also may need to know the intensity uh, or the mass of staining um, per area. There are also many, many different components within the tissue and within the cells I need to understand. And it also is very important to realize that anatomical context, the sense of place, is really critical um, to understanding uh, uh, what's going on in the tumor and just knowing what cells are there through uh, looking at transcriptomics or binding and grinding and measuring protein concentrations is insufficient to fully understand the tumor. So if I want to make a, a system that will allow me to study that complex microenvironment, I need a system that is both sensitive, that is it has a, a very high signal to noise ratio, it's specific, that is I can identify uh, the, the specific signals I'm interested in measuring and dissociate them from the background and from non-specific uh, non interactions. They need to have a dynamic range. One and zero is not sufficient. I need a range. And that range needs to be linear, linear so I can trust it. I also need to look at many, many factors in the same sample. And serial sectioning is usually insufficient because of the size of the cells that we're looking at and the size of the structures we're trying to identify. As I said, anatomical context is essential. And if possible, we'd love to be able to do this non-destructively to leave open the opportunity for coming back and studying either the sequence um, or, or RNA transcripts within the sample I'm looking at. This is what I was talking about earlier, the challenges of studying immuno-oncology. And this is a cartoon I drew, but we can see here within this sample, this is supposed to represent a microscope field of view. And maybe I have a blood vessel here in red. Uh, to the right of that, I have a large green cell that's our tumor cell. If you notice that there are little round cells next to that, those maybe represent immune cells, which are a fraction of the size of the cancer cell in many cases. There are also other things in the environment, stromal cells or cells that describe just the, the structure of the tissue in which the cell, uh, the tumor lives. There also are proteins and, and other microstructures that all interact with the tumor cell to define this environment and that go about defining this exact tumor uh, why I want to better understand it. So how do biologists understand this kind of environment today? Well, historically, um, the microscope was invented in the 17th century, and we had the ability uh, to start looking at things that were smaller than we could see with our naked eye. Um, but if you just look at a piece of tissue, and so on the left-hand side here, we see a section of mouse lung that is um, just thinly sliced and put on the micro microscope slide, you can see it's very difficult to see any structure, to see any cells of that. Um, but fortunately, the early microscopists were also very much involved with the textile industry. And so one of the first things they did was they took textile dyes, things that they would use to stain fabric blue or pink, and they applied those to the microscope slide, and suddenly structure became apparent. And so in the slide on the right, we can see the pink, which is stained with eosin and purple dots, which are the nuclei of the cells um, that stain the nucleus. Um, that, that science is called histochemistry. We can go further beyond the histochemistry. And here we have, again, a, a piece of, uh, of mouse lung uh, gener generously provided to us by Dr. Charles Freeberg at the University of Washington. Um, and so we have general histochemical staining on the left, but um, with Kuntz in 1945 and, and years later, developed the ability to look for very specific molecules within that tissue. So we see brown staining here with a, a so-called DAB reaction, in this case identifying the very specific mo uh, molecule, uh, uh, hyaluron. And so we can get very specific molecules with immunohistochemistry. The problem with that kind of immunohistochemistry is we're limited in the number of things we can look at at the same time. So here's a two color, it's actually uh, RNA fluorescence in situ hybridization, but you can see there's a little, there's a blue labeling in the, in the stain with, uh, with the arrow on, on um, and some of the arrows, and we can also see red staining with some of the other arrows. And the background of purple, um, and so you're trying to see pink and blue and purple all on top of each other. And so that limits our ability to see uh, staining with chromogenic stain. 
But if we look on the other side, we can see with fluorescence, we can see more colors. So here we have, a, on the right, we have a rat islets um, from the pancreas. In blue, we see the nuclei of these cells. And then we see staining in red, which is glucagon in the alpha cells that surround the islet. And then we see um, a staining in green, which is against insulin, which identifies the beta cells within the islet. And if we look at these colors independently, we can see that it's very easy for us to dissociate and to understand where the nuclei are, where the um, glucagon staining cells are, and where the insulin staining cells. But sometimes this few colors here, here we have three labels, sometimes that's not enough. And if you can see if we want to understand the complex environment of, uh, of a tumor, that we need much more than three stains. And so over the years, a number of techniques have been developed. Um, from chromogenic immunohistochemistry and fluorescence immunohistochemistry, which we just saw, to multispectral imaging, to spectral mix mixing, serial multiplexing, and many other techniques. Um, and today we're going to look at one of these in depth called serial multiplexing. And with that, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to Dr. Fiona Genti. Hi, hi everybody. This is uh, Fiona Ginty. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the great introduction and the uh, history of immunohistochemistry and the nice lead into the work that I'm about to present uh, for the next 30 minutes or so on uh, what we've done over the last uh, 10 over, over 10 years, actually, at the GE Global Research Center in uh, Niskayuna, New York. So I'm going to uh, just give you a sort of a step back in history, but also start with where we are today in terms of spatial cell biology and uh, the sort of importance that sort of bear in mind, some of you are new to this, some of, some of you are, 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 are studying this for some time now, but um, really spatial cell biology is opening up new insights into health and disease as regards looking at diseases at a single cell level really allows us to understand how and why uh, disease uh, uh, progress. And, gives us new insights into heterogeneity, into the types of cell types involved, the immune cells, uh, the different functionalities of those cells, and the microenvironment and the stroma uh, uh, around those cells, and, and, and potentially the crosstalk between those two uh, environments. And so with that, with that new level of understanding, by understanding where the cells are located, how they're interacting with each other, we can begin to now chip away at understanding disease mechanisms, um, immune response, spatial cell interactions, and hopefully that leads us towards new ways to diagnose a disease in the future. Now, when we started this work um, over 10 years ago, we really started with a blank slate and uh, at the time thought really deeply uh, about why we wanted to go into um, pathology. And we, as GE, as a storied history and in medical imaging, looked at what we had done in radiology and that transition from um, analog to digital uh, in radiology and saw really an opportunity in the pathology space for making that transition to, to digitized images and the potential value of that. And there were other companies working at that at the time, but we saw the, the key opportunities around speed, um, usability for the, for the pathologist, and then the content within the image. What else other than the H&E features that are so um, close to the, to, to the pathologist's workflow today, how could we um, expand that information uh, to be more protein-focused and cellular-focused? So we started this brand-new program back in uh, 2006. Many of us, most of us, in fact, had never worked in pathology or oncology before. But in a sense, that was a good way to start because we all came at the problem with a, new, with a new, unique mindset and how we might solve this problem. But this also precipitated our interactions with academia, pharma, and the clinical end users because we knew from them that we would need to know exactly what their workflows are, what their problems were today, and how we could solve together with them. So over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll t tell you more about how we um, went through that path. But just to sort of shortcut it to the end, you know, we fast forward, uh, you know, 10 years and we you know, in that time, we transitioned, we developed our workflows, we optimized them, we transferred it to Clarient and Neogenomics as a multi-omics uh, technology, and that was offered as a service. And then uh, two years ago, we started working more closely with our uh, Cytiva um, uh, collaborate, um, partners, rather, and uh, formerly GE Life Sciences, and then allowed us to deploy the system out to prototype, as prototypes out to our collaborators. And this really gave us the hands-on 
a knowledge that we needed together to to proceed um, to what is now today the commercial launch of Dalda, which we're all very proud of. So just to get into the uh, to the details and. Um, then we can talk a little bit more about the collaborations. But essentially, this is a uh, initiative uh, staining method. We use immunofluorescence. We developed a method by which we could do an antigen retrieval one time at the beginning of the process. A lot of work went into the imaging, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. But knowing you know, these samples, because we're in fluorescence imaging, we have background, so we had to consider that, that autofluorescence signal. Um, we image the sample after staining. Uh, we de-stain it, and then we do a cycle, 30 to 40 cycles for 60-plus biomarkers. And that gives us this very deep, uh, and you can see as I'm going through the slides here, uh, this very rich data set, which um, can then lead you into a process by which you can analyze all of these biomarkers at a single cell level and then facially, because the coordinates for every cell is conserved um, in, each of the, uh, in each of the images that are taken. So then we here we see an example from our, our publication that we had it back in uh, 2013 in the at PNAS, uh, where we show this montage of 43 different proteins in uh, colorectal cancer. And this was our first big publication, um, which we you know worked very hard at for several years to make sure we had covered all the bases and all the um, different aspects of the workflow so that we weren't just at that point pr presenting a set of images. We also presented comparisons to um, some ground truths. We worked with Memorial Sloan Kettering, which I'll show you in, in shortly, and then devised methods by which the images could be registered, the autofluorescence subtracted, and then um, sub cells could be segmented, and then we could buy, quantify it at a single biomarker level. So this whole workflow you know, took several years really to figure out and develop into a highly automated workflow where images could be processed as they were being collected, which is our sort of standard today as the images are being, um, as the samples are being imaged, they are automatically being registered, autofluorescence subtracted, and um, they are, you know, it's something that's done while you're imaging rather than waiting to the end of the process. So then when you're finished your whole experiment, you have a registered AF removed, a autofluorescence removed set of images for the number of biomarkers that you've, you've studied. And so with that, you know, we had the next challenge was really the uh, reducing these millions of data points because as, you know, in one field of view, you have perhaps 3,000 cells depending on the cancer type. Now scale that to 50, 100 patients if you're working with TMAs or if you're working with whole tissue sections. Uh, you now are in a, in a sphere of millions and, uh, and, and even close to bil a billion data points, and depending on how many biomarkers. So we developed a lot of different workflows, which we've published on over the years, on looking at you know biomarker correlations, um, assuming you know a certain biomarker should be co-expressed, then we should see these in these types of correlation plots that we generate. Um, the darker the the circle here being the stronger the association between those markers. Uh, we developed some nice workflows for clustering different types of cells depending on their biomarker expression. And then working with our collaborators, we translated all of that workflow to real life examples. And in this example, I'll talk about again later in Dr. Carcinoma in situ, you can see where we look at both the lesion area, which is uh, colored in brown. It's a very homogeneous um, group of um, cells, uh, as opposed to the patients below it, which is more heterogeneous, there's more colors present. And you also see, interestingly, in this particular patient, the same sample, a lot of immune cells around the outside of the lesion, and on the patient below that, less immune cells. So we're actually doing a larger study on this at the moment with Indiana University. So then with that, you know, you really open up the door once you've got your workflows down, you're, you're confident about the reproducibility, uh, you have the antibody validation, which was another huge part of what we, we've done over the last 10 years. You can really start to uh, think about where um, single cell analysis makes sense. And we have done studies in immunophenotyping. Uh, we've looked at the single signaling pathway heterogeneity. This was also part of the PNAS paper. And then we've also more recently started working in neurology and applying the same workflows. Now, with all of that, of course, we have to consider the, the hardware itself. And so uh, a key, key part of what we've done 
over the last um, 10 years is really uh, ensuring that the, the quality of the images is, is consistent. There's a calibration workflow that we uh, put in place to ensure that the um, systems are can be compared to each other, the data output can be compared to each other. And uh, this was um, carried forward uh, over the last 10 years when we um, uh, implemented the workflow at, at NIA Genomics. These calibrations were also put in place. And so it's just been a hallmark of, of, of our workflow and ensures really the quality of the data um, at, the, at the end of, of a study and allows it to be comparable to, to other subsequent data sets in the future. Now, just so that we can um, sort of not uh, certainly take credit for all of the work that we did, we, our team is a multidisciplinary team. We, we're really, you know, as an amazing team to work with over the last decade. We're, we're, we're comprised of biologists and chemists and engineers and computer vision scientists and statisticians and uh, physicists and, and, and you name it. Um, but we, you know, the beauty of this team was that we were able to work closely with uh, these collaborators, um, and I'm just going to mention a few today, um, but uh, I'll uh, briefly talk about e what we did with each of them and how we learned from them, we listened to them, we learned from them, and then how in turn we uh, deployed uh, those workflows into into what is uh, CellDive today. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Cancer Center, fantastic collaborators, uh, Eli Lilly, um, pharmaceutical company, and then our various uh, NIH programs, which we um, are awards uh, that we, we achieved in collaboration with, with several different collaborators across the US uh, and internationally as well. So really, uh, so I'll start with Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, or MSKCC. Um, we really worked with them from day one um, on uh, back in, in uh, 2006, we were really learning from scratch about the pathology space and, you know, spent many days down in, in at their pathology um, uh, department, watching them, watching the, the pathologists, watching the workflows, understanding what could be changed and what could not be changed within the uh, standard uh, immunohistochemistry workflow. A um, few key things that we learned during this time, um, we started with breast cancer because that was one uh, area where we, you know, there were, there were well-documented, uh, well-reported uh, markers, estrogen receptor, HER2 staining, that have, you know, are widely used in diagnosis today. So that gave us our ground truth on which we uh, started to compare a lot of our assays and our assay performance. Um, we also then, once we had some confidence in, in the performance of our antibodies and our workflows, we then started to get more complicated. And they had some very nice RNA expression data sets uh, that, we, uh, that they wanted to compare our, our workflows to. So that's sort of another important point in any new technology. For those of you who are already working in this type of field is you know, comparing back to the previous data or the earlier data and, and proving that either you get the same results or equivocal or, uh, or a new finding is, is, but certainly step one is to, to prove that you compare to what's been done before an alternative method. Um, another key learning from this period was in working with the pathologist there was the need for a, something that was familiar to them. So this virtual H&E we, we developed. So we converted the grayscale images to uh, what looks like an H&E, and you can see that here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the figure uh, shown on the right, that pink image is created from that uh, brown grayscale image. Um, so those are the two sort of key things of many, many learnings as well, but just that ground truth and, and the reference uh, image that was familiarity to, to the pathologist was very important. And then once we, you know, we'd worked with MSK for, for a few years at that point, then, as I said, we started to get more complex. And there they um, um, proposed that we do a, an RNA expression uh, comparison study where we, uh, they already knew the results. They knew, uh, in this case, the correlation with FTG uptake. And they wanted to prove that we could find the same correlation. And in fact, we did. And um, we also showed, um, not surprisingly, and you can see in these smaller images from the publication uh, with uh, Dr. Ingo Mellinghoff, um, these are overlaid pie charts are clusters of cells. And the more color, there are more uh, block colors. So and here you see yellow, more yellow, that's more homogeneous, is more of that type of cluster, cluster eight. And whereas on the figure on the left, 
we see much more heterogeneity, more uh, colors in each of the pie charts. And so this was really the sort of the start of, of our work and, the, and of others in looking and thinking about heterogeneity and how that um, relates to, to outcomes. Now, in parallel with that, we also knew that we needed to understand the uh, pharmaceutical workflow. And here we worked with Eli Lilly again for about five years. In fact, we worked with them on cell lines, preclinical samples, clinical samples from multiple sites, so looking at that cross-site variability, and then also looking at larger retrospective cohorts with recurrence and outcome data. So that gave us a new um, understanding of data size, big data comparisons uh, with across groups, stratification, and we developed all of our statistical workflows in, in R, which are still used today, and uh, we share readily with our collaborators. But here we also looked at antibody validation. This was, of course, a very key uh, theme that carried all the way through all of our collaborations and having a really well characterized workflow, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Another thing that we learned with Eli Lilly is, you know, as we went from, you know, in our early days, we were just working on one microscope and now the need grew to go to multiple microscopes. So we set up a lab with 10 microscopes and there inlaid the challenge for calibration, for um, cross comparison of, of data, uh, quality control slides, uh, control slides, um, et cetera, study design. And so we really, uh, for a few years with Eli Lilly and with our other collaborators, really focused on our statistical workflows, our normalization. And again, that sort of led to where we are today in terms of when we publish papers, we always describe our workflow and uh, um, you know, share our experiences on that, um, uh, on that sort of scaling from one microscope to multiple microscopes. And here on the right is just some of the work that we uh, published with Eli Lilly that they were very interested in. Um, blood vessel development, and uh, we looked at um, um, many different markers related to early stage blood vessel maturation, late stage blood, blood vessel maturation, and the interaction with the immunoprofiling. Um, we really, as I said, focus on antibody validation workflow, and this is just where I want to emphasize for just just a moment that we, um, you know, worked out this uh, uh, sort of very rigorous. Uh, workflow, which we still use today. Um, at the time when we started to work with Eli Lilly, Dr. Jeremy Graff, who we worked with at the time, was extremely helpful and, and rigorous with us in, in advising us how best and what they would need from a pharma uh, direct perspective. And this certainly maps to every other collaborator that we worked with since. And, and we have hundreds of antibodies that we've, uh, commercial antibodies that we've validated to this point where we do a direct conjugation, so we directly label those antibodies with, with our dyes, uh, thiocyanine dyes or alexa dyes, and that in turn allows you to uh, do this high level of multiplexing. So we do a primary, secondary, usually in the first round, and then follow that with uh, direct conjugates um, for how many, and however many rounds are needed. Uh, we also test a number of dyes uh, to protein ratio. We keep that consistent. We always test from batch to batch variability. So a lot of really important um, 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 consistencies that are important for your, you know, follow repeating of your study and, uh, and those are implemented in the protocols that are, 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 are shared today, both in our publications and as part of the cell dive package. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit um, for the next uh, five minutes or so on a few different uh, um, our, our NIH programs. And this was really, you know, a fantastic opportunity back in 2008. This was really, you know, very, very early days for single cell analysis. And we um, were able to, you know, with the NIH who were establishing a single cell analysis program at the time, this gave, uh, you know, really a huge head start to the field. So we're always, you know, very thankful to the NIH for, for that. And then our collaborators that we worked with at the time, in particular, uh, uh, we started with Vanderbilt University. Uh, we also worked with SUNY Albany. And uh, so Dr. Bob Coffey and his team, we, we conducted work on single cell analysis in colon cancer development. Uh, with that, you know, you sort of do, you, there are many benefits to, to these types of relationships. You understand better what they need from a research perspective. In this case, we needed very precise single cell segmentation because the cells that we were looking at in colon are very varied in their, in their shape and their size and, and no cell, you do not want to leave any cell uh, out of, of your analysis. Um, this group were a very early adopter of the cell dive prototype and they've been using it ever since, giving us great feedback. And then more recently, they were one of the five awardees of the Human Tumor Atlas 
Um, so that was quite exciting to see uh, that progress, you know, from beginning to where they are today. Um, in the last five years, then, um, I've also been PI on um, uh, this work with Indiana University and uh, with Dr. Sunil Badvi and Dr. Yesen Poehler. And here we're looking at, again, taking all of the, the learnings that I've explained earlier around um, heterogeneity on clustering, data analysis, and looking at uh, cellular heterogeneity of DCIS lesions of ductal carcinoma in situ at the earliest stage of breast cancer, it's pre-invasive. Pre and here we're looking at um, 20 to 30 different markers related to both cell signaling as well as immune response. We're looking at different ethnicities. We're comparing across these different groups the uh, expression of these proteins and how they differ in terms of outcome. We're right in the middle of analyzing our outcome data at the moment, and uh, that should be concluded this summer, but seeing very marked differences from patient to patient in immune response. So I think this data is going to be you know, quite exciting once we're, we're finished and we're, we're publishing, of course, all this work. Another uh, very uh, more software-focused project that we, we've been working with UPIT for, for many years, and um, here we have been uh, working with Lance Taylor and, and, and um, Chakrish and Bata. And uh, in this case, we have a, had a very uh, sort of a, a different type of approach. Here we, we developed heterogeneity algorithms, which are actually available on uh, the, what we call the Thrive uh, website. And, and this is related to the uh, acronym, is related to tumor heterogeneity. And um, here we look at heterogeneity, spatial heterogeneity. We continue some of our work on colorectal cancer. We're able to carry some of these data sets through. Uh, we have um, shown in this, in this web-based analysis that we can uh, both conduct very simple um, a single cell analysis as well as the uh, metrics for quantifying heterogeneity. And both these uh, uh, work are published, and, and we continue to have a very good relationship with uh, the University of Pittsburgh and that team. Now, we, of course, mo mostly focused our work around oncology to begin with, um, and for still today, but we did uh, do some very interesting work, and this work is led by Dan Meyer, uh, Dr. Dan Meyer at the GE Research Center. And here he, he's extended cell dive workflow to neuroscience. And taking many of the same uh, concepts, but of course, neurology is a very different um, beast to, to oncology. But looking at molecular diversity, cellular interactions, and the microenvironmental factors in brain and the underlying mechanisms of neurodegeneration. And he has also been uh, the, a recipient of several awards from the NIH, working with UCSF, and Mount Sinai, and, and Boston University. And so we've been working for the last couple of years on very large cohorts that um, have been provided by each of these sites and looking at many of these questions that are very sort of carry through, you know, from disease to disease. Um, heterogeneity, cell to cell interaction is, is just now, you know, a very common theme no matter what type of disease uh, state you're, uh, you're working on. Um, and most recently, uh, this has been a very exciting uh, new uh, area for us. We're working with the hub map, the NIH, part of the NIH uh, Commons Fund. And here we're looking with a large consortium. We're, in our case, we're looking at healthy tissue. Uh, we're looking at multi-scale 3D image analytics. This is led by uh, my colleague Yosef Al-Kafahi and, 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 and Anup Sood. And here, again, we're working with University of Pittsburgh and the dermatology department. And we're combining uh, the uh, multiplex imaging, serial multiplex imaging of skin samples together with micro CT and seeing, you know, how we can combine sort of a 3D reconstruction of these multiplex images together with a, a, a validated, if you like, 3D imaging method, micro CT. And uh, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at is, you know, once we've got that 3D reconstruction, that analysis done, how do you look at changes um, as a function of aging and UV exposure, look at changes in immune cells, for example, over time or in relation to UV damage, markers of DNA damage. Um, so this work is, is just in its first year and uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting group to be part of. There's a lot of other cell atlas efforts going on across the US and around the world at the moment. And, um, you know, I think it's sort of we're all learning together as well as you know, re recognizing that there are many commonalities across uh, both disease type, organ, and uh, tissue. 
So just to my last slide um, before I transition over to, to Prachi, but, um, you know, we're sort of close out here on, uh, you know, many years on foundation of, of research, of, of development, of ideas and concepts that we implemented into software and workflows. And uh, 2014 was was a landmark for us because we at that point had um, had confidence in the in the standardization of our workflow. We had you know scaled the workflow, the data analytics, the software, and so we worked then closely with Clarion um, to transition all of those workflows to their uh, service lab and, and uh, their own regulated environment in 2014. And they then um, you know took it from there, if you like, and they developed a clinical laboratory improvement amendment, CLIA assay for Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, published that work, showed that the workflow, um, uh, multiplexing workflow, single cell multiplexing workflow compared um, uh, uh, extremely well with the, the pathologist review of a single slide analysis of Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, we also, subsequent to that, as I said earlier, we started to do prototype proto type deployment and we started uh, with Sunnybrook um, Health Sciences Center Toronto and Vanderbilt etc and they all just really provided us with critical user needs uh, calibration automation and just troubleshooting in general and then uh, 2017 2018 we started to expand expand that out to other expert uh, collaboration sites and now we're here today in 2020 and uh, commercializing uh, the platform uh, together with uh, Cytiva. And so I just want to close on, on this slide just to sort of remind you of, you know, how we, um, we at the beginning did not know the space. We did not fully understand the space as scientists and engineers, but we listened, we learned, we developed uh, robust protocols. We took all our feedback and turned it into a, a, a workflow that was, was relevant. And we focused on disease-specific applications to show the utility of what we were doing and why. And we just tried to, along the way, publish and continuously approve, improve our workflows so that they stayed current with the times and uh, stayed relevant. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to uh, transfer over to uh, Rachi Baghetto, and uh, she'll tell you more about the cell dive imaging workflow. Hi, everybody. I'm Prachi Bilgetto. Thank you, Fiona, for walking us through all of the development that went into the Cell Dive Multiplex Imaging Solution, which is what I will be talking about for the next 10 minutes or so. So as we heard from Paul, we've seen a resurgence in multiplex imaging. The real driver for that is the advent of immuno-oncology and therapies that harness a patient's immune system to fight cancer. The imaging technologies we had in the past do not provide rich enough data to help us guide these therapies for patients to better outcomes, but also to give us the information we need about the immune system of patients to develop better therapies in the future. The so present imaging, as you see in the um, traditional H&E, in this case is the virtual H&E, as Fiona described, gives us some very rough information. First and most important, is this tissue cancerous or not? It gives us some information about the type and number of cells in the tumor and around the tumor. But what we really need is the rich information that multiplex imaging brings to diagnoses, such as what cell types are present? What is their biomarker expression profile? What's the nature and the extent of vascularization within the tumor microenvironment? What kind of cells are in the tumor and around the tumor? And what are the specific immune cells within the tumor? This is the kind of information that we need to really harness the power of the immune system for therapies in cancer. So at the top of this slide, you see what is a traditional imaging workflow. This happens to be a bright field imaging workflow, which is typically limited to one or two biomarkers per slide. And so what that compels the researcher to do, as you can see here, is to make serial sections and slides of this one precious piece of tissue, since you can only stain and visualize at best two and usually one biomarker per tissue slide. What multiplex imaging, and specifically cell dive multiplex imaging, brings to the table is the ability to visualize 
60 plus proteins from the same tissue slice and leaving it intact for other investigations. So as Fiona described, it took many, many years to refine both the staining and the imaging for this particular technology. And we're pleased to talk you through a little bit about what it is and what is now available. So we introduce here CellDive Multiplex Imaging Solution, which is a completely customizable multiplex solution that precisely maps up to more than 60 biomarkers from just one tissue section with resolution at a single cell level. When we say customizable, what do we mean? You choose the assay panels. You choose which biomarkers and how many you would like to visualize. All of the work that you heard Fiona describe in refining this technology comes together to bring extreme precision to all of the imaging. So we take precision engineered hardware, innovative acquisition software to give you precise imaging and downstream the capability to do single cell analysis. And as you know, by now, we've spent many, many years refining all of these technologies. So we um, can bring reproducible, reliable results. So what are the components of the cell dive multiplex imaging system? So you've taken all of the innovation in the workflow, which Fiona described and I will describe a little bit later, and the acquisition software. Together with a vast list of validated commercially available antibodies and package them into a license. The second component is the imager, which I'll discuss in detail later. And the third piece is analysis software. We've chosen to partner with Indica Labs and their software platform, Halo. And I'll talk a little bit in detail about why we think Halo is the best choice to interpret the results from this kind of imaging. So at a high level, the cell dive multiplex imaging solution workflow is displayed on this slide. In terms of inputs, you can input an entire tissue slide. So the system is capable of handling the standard tissue size of a human biopsy. You have the option to choose within that whole piece of tissue individual regions of interest. You can also input a tissue microarray. There are five steps to the imaging and staining rounds. You need the background autofluorescence imaging, stain the sample, image the sample. The system does the image processing and alignment for you. You inactivate the dye. And this process can be repeated as many times as you need for 60 plus biomarker visualization. Downstream then you would analyze the data and interpret the results from your imaging. So at a high level, that's the workflow. That's what enables the imaging of 60 plus biomarkers. Biomarker panel design. So when we say completely customizable, that's really what we mean. You choose the biomarkers, you choose which biomarkers. The cell dive solution includes a list of thoughtfully curated antibodies, all of which are commercially available. Um, there are polyclonals, monoclonals, mouse and human, antibodies that relate to well-studied and understood disease states and signaling pathways, including the most prevalent modalities of cancer. And if this list doesn't include antibodies that pertain to your area of research, there is within the software a very detailed protocol to allow you to characterize your own antibodies. So we provide you complete flexibility in terms of panel design. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the dye um, inactivation process that really allows the cyclical staining that leaves your tissue intact. So the tissue is stained with DAPI as a nuclear stain. This is what allows the, the image registration of serial images and then up to four dye conjugated antibodies at one time. The dyes themselves are inactivated to turn off the dye molecule, so the samples are not damaged. And this is really what allows for the cyclical nature of the staining. Um, as you saw in some of the work Fiona presented, the first patent for this, this uh, serial staining 
and deactivation was issued in 2009. It's been significantly refined since then. So to image the slides that have been stained with this process, we've created a purpose-built software suite. And really the goal is to make multiplexing seamless for the user. The software itself tracks every single slide in the process, so that allows you to do studies with um, a large number of slides. It allows you to do different studies um, interrupting each other without having to keep track of which particular slide is where in the workflow. Within the software, there's an automated calibration routine, so that allows you to correlate your data across multiple slides, across multiple studies, and across multiple imagers, should that be the case. All of the image processing and alignment is automated and refined, and this is really what enables the downstream single cell analysis. The software is coupled with the imager. The imager is built on our InCell platform, which we released in 2001. We are experts in precision engineering, and this system is fast, precise, and sensitive. We made some improvements to um, better facilitate tissue imaging. So the system is capable of imaging in five channels or, or wavelengths at the same time. The barcode reader is integrated with the system and with the software, so this is how you can track your slides. It's compatible with a slide handling robot, so you can walk away while it does the imaging, the image processing, and image alignment. It has a large maximum imaging area. It can handle very large tissue with absolutely no issues. The final component of the cell dive multiplex imaging system is HALO image analysis software. And we chose HALO for its ease of use and scalability. Uh, the interface is very logical, it's very intuitive, and what we really wanted to do is to bring the capability to analyze these images to people who may not have any bioinformatics experience. We've worked with HALO extensively during our beta testing period, and we found their responsiveness and user support to be world class. HALO comes in different modules with different licenses, so you can choose what best suits your work. So here's just one example of how all of these come together, all of these components come together to provide the capability to do true single cell analysis. So what you see here on the left is the image of a tonsil tissue that was part of a 30 marker cell dive study. Here we've highlighted five of those markers and as you progress from left to right, you can see staining, segmentation, classification, and finally down to single cell analysis of cellular phenotypes. This is just one of many examples of how the cell dive imaging system in all of its components comes together to bring you reliable, reproducible results. None of this would have been possible without the expertise, the innovation, and the sheer persistence of the GE Research Cell Dive team, past and present. We owe them a huge thank you. Without them, we wouldn't be bringing this capability to the market today. So we'd love to keep in touch with you. If you'd like more information, you can go to citiva.com forward slash cell dive or drop us a note, cell.dive at citiva.com. Thank you for your time and attention today, and um, we'd be happy to take questions.
All right. Thank you for those presentations. We're going to move into the Q and A section. Um, so we're going to we have quite a few questions here. Okay. So one of the first questions is. Both noise and background are non-specific signals. Um, why is one linked to uh, specificity and the other to sensitivity? Um, do one of you guys want to take that question? I think that's a good one for Fiona. Sure. Yeah. So um, that's a that's a good question. So when we image a sample, uh, we always take a background imaging step uh, first of all. Um, because we want to remove the uh, inherent fluorescence that's present in the tissue that comes from collagen, that comes from formalin, uh, et cetera. So we take that as a, a first step before we actually stain the sample. So that um, background or AF removal or a, a subtraction, we call it sometimes, um, that is a, a source of inherent signal within the sample. Now, when you have a staining protocol, and now we go through a very rigorous process of, of validating our antibodies, and we try to eliminate those um, markers that produce non-specific staining. But um, sometimes either because of the sample quality, or maybe the uh, antibody doesn't perform quite as well as you would expect, you may see a non-specific staining in the background. And sometimes if the sample is sticky, if there's a lot of blood vessels, for example, and um, there can be what we call non-specific staining. Now, that is something that you have to look out for, really, at the point of antibody validation, and hopefully not include an antibody that has a non-specific performance characteristics. But for the uh, inherent fluorescence, that can be subtracted from your image prior to the staining step, and that increases your signal uh, to background um, ratio. So hopefully that answers the question, and I'm happy to answer anything else uh, you, you have in that regard. Next question. I, I'm happy to take the next one here. Please go ahead. All right, one of the questions here um, is, what is the difference between noise and background? So I'll take that again. I think that's related to my last um, question. Um, you have, or last answer rather. So you have a background that's inherent uh, to the sample, the fluorescence that comes from the formalin, from the type of tissue, lung tissue, can have a lot of um, um, background uh, signal due to the collagen and, and, and other connective tissue components. And then noise comes from the noise within the system, the technical variation. Um, it can also be related um, to the non-specificity of, of some antibodies as well. So it's sort of a blend of, of information or data that you don't actually want to have or reduce as much as possible for your final uh, results that you generate. Perfect. So actually, here's I know. Okay. Can you hear oh. me now? Yes, I thought. Oh, amazing, oh. amazing how it worked. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, not quite sure what happened there. Uh, so I have some questions, and first one uh, is for for Fiona. What have, have you been able to learn about the tissue microenvironment through this methodology? Mm -hmm. um, so Paul, that's a great question. Um, it's been a big learning process over over many years. First of all, again, you need the antibodies to um, reflect the biology that's in the tumor microenvironment. But the immune response is one that we've seen to be particularly profound and varying hugely from patient to patient. So you see in some patients a very dense uh, surrounding of the tumor with immune cells and different functionality, different cell states, different proliferative states. And then in others, you uh, patients, you don't see any anything at all or very little. So that to me has always just been so interesting and it relates so much to um, T cell therapy and uh, you know the prospects there for how it might be applied to solid tumors and uh, immunotherapies in general. So I think that's an area that really is, you know, got a long way to go in terms of really understanding. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, Prachi, this is a question for you. What if my target is not on the list of validated antibodies? Can I still use cell dive? Sure, thanks, Paul. Absolutely, you can. Within the cell dive software, there is a step-by-step -step detailed protocol that will guide you in characterizing um, the antibody of your choosing to see, you know, do you get the kind of binding that you need? Do you have the sensitivity, the specificity that you need? Um, certainly there is a step-by-step -step protocol and that is part of, you know, we deliberately designed this to be as open a system as possible to give researchers full flexibility to use the antibodies of, that cho of their choice. So that is absolutely supported. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Fiona, this is a question for you. Um, the question is, my understanding is that you deactivate the floor for between rounds, but the antibodies would remain bound to the epitopes. Will the antibodies um, from subsequent staining rounds cross-react? I guess it's mm -hmm. another question. Does the order of staining make a difference as well? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, part of the process, yes, you do. The antibodies do remain bound to the epitopes you inactivate the floor for. So part of our process is twofold. One, we directly label the antibodies. Um, we have a first step, uh, primary, secondary step, which can we sort of leave those uh, slots open so that we, if an antibody doesn't conjugate well, for example, um, then we have the option of putting in their primary, secondary in the first round. So there, of course, you have to be very careful with cross-reactivity because uh, the secondaries, of course, you need to have different species and you need to make sure that the first, second round doesn't bind back to the other uh, antibodies that are maybe from the same species. For the subsequent rounds, then we use the um, directly labeled antibodies and uh, that cross-reactivity isn't, isn't an issue at that point. We already have had a, a front blocking step and then we're just using monoclonal, um, generally monoclonal, but also polyclonal in some cases. And um, we from prominently used a mix of rabbit, anything really that has been, you know, made it all the way through our antibody validation process. Um, and they're directly labeled. So we're not using the um, secondary antibodies at that point. And just another, uh, uh, another answer to that question, because you asked about sequence. So importantly, two things. One, the primary, secondary, they go up front. You don't um, you mix the uh, species. The second thing is the epitope sensitivity to the inactivation protocol. So we test all of our antibodies and the epitopes prior to during the validation process to confirm that they are not uh, damaged by the oxidation process. It's fundamentally an oxidation process and um, by which the dye is, is, is inactivated. And so if there is an epitope effect, uh, which we find in about 10%, so we validated about 400 or more antibodies to date, so roughly about 10%, you do see a, a, a decrease in signal. You can either try another antibody, a different epitope, or put that antibody earlier on in, in the sequence. Um, so those are sort of the two main considerations for the sequence. Um, and then otherwise, we find most of our antibodies, all the other antibodies perform very well. Um, they are repeatable, and they are can be placed in the sequence um, wherever you need to position them. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a question here pertaining, um, has it, have you tried or has anyone tried applying this methodology to 3D culture models to better understand culture mm -hmm. models? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. Um, in fact, we were doing some work recently on this. Um, in fact, we haven't gone so far as to apply it to the intact 3D structure. Uh, we have sectioned, we fixed and sectioned um, these samples, and that seems to work fine. It works very well. We, we, we um, have tested in cell culture systems as well as tissue samples. So our, at least our direct experience is on the uh, fixation and the sectioning of 3D. Now, there are groups uh, at the NIH, for example, who are using clearing methods for 3D and doing a different type of multiplexing. So it is possible, and it depends on what kind of question you're asking, whether you want to go into 2D and, and then uh, do the same in that way, or if you want to do 3D, then you want to go into a more confocal based approach. Great. Um, one of the questions we have pertains to an earlier comment that I made, so I'll be glad to answer it. Uh, it has to do with the difference between noise and background. 
Um, to me, noise is a systematic error in measurement and has to do both with, uh, um, it just has to do primarily with statistics and how you measure something that's randomly fluctuating and the certainty that you can have in those fluctuations. Um, and the closer that those fluctuations are to the background, uh, to, to the zero cutoff, the less certain you could be in your measurement. Whereas background is a systematic offset that could be caused either by non-specificity of an antibody or could be caused by light leakage or other things, autofluorescence, other aspects that will increase the, um, the signal not specific to the measurement I wanna make. And so uh, uh, signal to noise or the amount of signal that you have relative to those random fluctuations generally determines how what your detection level will be, so how low you can go in, in, in mass and still be able to detect it. Whereas the specificity, uh, my ability to specifically measure what I'm interested in has to often to do with the background intensity uh, around um, other things that cause intensity not related to my signal itself. So I'll take uh, one more. There's a the question about how is the inactivation of the dye molecule um, transpire? What, what goes on there that deactivates the, the fluorescence molecule? Mm -hmm. So where we use a mild uh, um, oxidation method that um, we use cyanine dyes, cyanine backbone, so cyanide dyes, alexi dyes um, are compatible with this oxidation process and um, that removes, uh, oxidizes, destructs the dye within uh, 15 minutes or so. So it's um, pretty quick and mild on the tissue. Great, thank you very much. Well, I see that our time is just about up, and so we're going to, um, I'm just going to ask if there's any final comments that either Prachi or Fiona would like to make. Um, otherwise, uh, any questions that we weren't able to get to, we'll follow up with email and make them available to the entire audience. Uh, thank you again, speakers, for your time today and for your important research and your work in this matter. We'd also like to thank LabRoots for sponsoring this and helping out with this presentation. Um, and again, if you have any questions, we'll try to pick them up through email. Um, and thank you and have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you.